again, we want to welcome you to our worship at the Common Presbyterian Church here in Bowling Green. Before we begin our worship service this morning, I want to reference the flowers that are on our altar table this morning. They are in honor of Dan Jacobson, me mom's retirement, and also her birthday. And the flowers are given with love by Trevor and Brenda Shaw. Also this week, we've had several things to occur within my family and Faith's family as well. I ask that you remember the family of Barbara Waits, uh, who suddenly died this past week in our family, and I was unable to go home to Covington, Tennessee for her memorial service. And also, I ask that you remember Sherry Gentry, who is in Skyline Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. She suffered a brain aneurysm, and she is in intensive care at the present time. We appreciate your prayers of comfort as well as your prayers uh, for healing. I invite you now to join with me, remembering the words of the psalmist this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Pray these things 
In Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to our seven side of time, which we always do in our worship services on Sunday morning, a time to worship God for the giving of our morning time and offering. 
Over the past few weeks, I want to thank you for your faithful and continuous generous giving to support the ministry of our church. And this morning, we're going to have Faith sing our offertory for this morning. But we also want to give thanks to God for the way He continues to bless our life, even in these times of uncertainty. So this morning, with this on our hearts, let us think about this thought. We are invited to give because of our hope in Christ Jesus that sustains us. The love and presence of God upholds all of us. Out of that sustaining hope, let us give our gifts not only today, as we have in the past weeks, but in the future, for those who also need the hope that we find in Jesus Christ our Lord. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and
and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will never leave you until I have done what I have promised. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. And he called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Now we ask, O God, that all the meditations of our hearts and the words of thy servant find acceptance in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. I want to begin this morning by asking you to imagine that you are a college student and that you have been asked to sign up to be a part of a social experiment. You show up at the psychology, the psychology building and you enter into the classroom. And they tell you that what they will be testing is the ability of a group to perform effectively together as a team. And so what do they do? They give each team a ball and tell you that the object of your team is to throw that ball among the other students that are with you. Always throwing the ball up in the air. You can't hold on to the ball. You got to keep throwing the ball from one person to another. And you got to make sure that the ball doesn't hit the ground. You got to keep the ball up in the air as long as possible. They really want to measure how well some teams can do this effectively. And so the game begins. And the clock starts. And they don't start throwing the ball in the air. And you're in that group and you're ready to participate. But what you don't realize is, is this. The game is rigged. That is, everybody is in on what's going on. Except you. Everybody knows that they are never going to pass that ball to you. And the object is not actually testing the team's effectiveness, but this little game that they're going to play with the ball, what they're actually testing is someone's response to being excluded, to being isolated, not to be a part of a group. And so they keep playing the game, and at first you lean in and you're trying to participate, but after a while, you start to give up. You lean back instead of leaning in, and you literally want to grab that ball, and you want to go home. However, what's even more fascinating is once the experiment was over, they discovered what the participants felt. And it wasn't just frustration or being upset or angry or sad. What they discovered was the greatest thing of all was is not being able to receive the ball. And for those who could not receive the ball, they showed higher levels of hopelessness and meanness and purposes, all because of a simple game. You know the Bible tells us that it's not good to be alone. And we all know this in its truest form, not just from personal experience, but we know that we're not to be alone because God's words tells us that we're not to be alone. That we are meant for community. That we are meant for one another. And yet we're living in this time when we cannot be together in ways in which 
we are so used to being together. What's interesting to me is, is that we had an epidemic before we had this pandemic. We had an ep epidemic of loneliness when we all could be together. And so if we think for a minute that when the stores open up and our church is open, that all things are going to go back to normal as much as possible, if we think all of a sudden we're not going to be lonely anymore, just because we go back, quote, unquote, to normal. I think we're missing the point. You see, the point is, is that loneliness is much deeper than just being without being with another person. Loneliness is about something where there is a sense of hope. There is something deep within us that we long for. And the answer to loneliness is so much more. Last week I invited you to take Psalms 23 and make it a prayer for your home. By inviting God to be present with you, I hope that you've been doing this as a family. This morning we're not going to talk about a prayer, but what we are going to talk about is a promise. We're going to talk about how the antidote, the remedy, the cure for loneliness is not what you think. But the antidote to loneliness is worshiping, even in your own home. So in order for us to do that, I want to share a story with you this morning about a man named Jacob, whose homeless trickery has turned into treachery, he has thrown his life away, trying to steal his birthright from his brother. His brother becomes so angry that he wants to murder him, and now Jacob flees for his life, life on his own. He doesn't know exactly where he's going or what life will actually be like when he gets there. But Jacob is fled. He doesn't know what that destination will entail, According to our text, he has nothing over his head, and he is completely alone. And yet somehow in the midst of that solitude, Jacob discovers what his true home will really be like. How does Jacob do it? He does it with an old promise. He does it with a new perspective. And he does it with a renewed practice. First, let's talk about the old promise. You can almost imagine Jacob, the younger brother, growing up with Esau, and every time at dinner, when his father, Isaac, says, have I told you about the time that God promised that, you, you, that your grandfather Abraham, that your descendants would be like the stars in the sky? They say, yeah, 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 Dad, you told us that story. And then Isaac would say, and I told you about that time that God forged a covenant with them and there was this fire and by the fire God's presence walked among them in the midst of it. Yeah, yeah, Dad. You've told us that story. And he keeps telling them that story over and over again. They grew up hearing the promise. And maybe for Jacob, those promises were just words. Maybe for somebody a long time ago, but what relevance would they have for me, Jacob thinks. And so Jacob's entire life was trying to get it for himself, trying to acquire it, trying to grab it, and yet all that grabbing took him somewhere that he really didn't want to go. And so Jacob discovered that old promise that God had given to him in a personal way. And God meets Jacob personally. And what did God say to Jacob? 
I will watch over you. I will love the part, and this is the part that I love, where God says, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Lewis B. says that everything in history hinges on a promise made and a promise kept. And our God is a promise-keeping, promise-making God. In Rockford, Illinois, it is a town that is unusual because it has a tremendous high number of homeless veterans. And the mayor of that city went to a particular seminar, and while attending that seminar, he made a promise while he was there to go back to that city and to make housing first a priority for all veterans in that city. He started chipping away at that problem when he returned home, and after a few years, every veteran in that town had a place to stay. But what they also noticed was that all the other issues in the veteran's life got better because they had a home. Aren't you glad that God has a housing first priority with you? And that God perceives us relentlessly to say to all of us, I have a place for you. As God pursues Jacob, Jesus pursues each one of us and says, I have a place for you. And that there are no preconditions on those housing arrangements that I offer for you in eternity. Jesus says, other than trusting, trusting in the promise. And you don't have to get your act together before you're able to have a relationship with God. Because God will meet you right now where you are in your home. And God will make good on his promise. Several years ago, I had a good friend who bought a sports jacket. And when he got it home, what he discovered was is that his sports jacket, it attracted lint. He didn't really like the way it fit. But this major department store had a major policy for returning things. And so after a little while, he thought, I'm going to return this sport coat back to the department store. And that was the day when you had to go into the store. And so he took that jacket and he goes back to this major department store. And when he walks in, he's just bluntly honest with the salesman. He says, I really don't like this jacket. It never really fit well. And it, and it, it collects any, it collects lint with anything that touches it. I really would like a different one. And the salesman looks back at him and says, what's taking you so long? I firmly believe that no matter where you are this morning, God is going to say to you, if you don't know him, remember he relentless pursues you. God says, what's taking you so long? God is faithful in all of his promises. God is trustworthy in all that he says to us. And so what Jacob discovers is that the promise that God made to Isaac and Abraham, that promise is not only true for his parents, his grandparents, it's actually true for him. I wonder how many of you who are sitting in your home or listening this morning have heard these stories told over and over again. You've heard the promises of God throughout your life, through all these years. And yet you thought, like Jacob, these promises were never really for you. But what you'll discover is, is in this encounter that God hopes to have with you, the words that he said to Jacob, he says to you, I'm not going to leave you until I've done what I have promised. So in the story of 
Jacob, we find that there's an old promise, but there's also a new perspective, a vision. Let me describe what that vision might have looked like for Jacob. In biblical times in the land of Ur, there would have been what was called a ziggurat. And a ziggurat was an architectural building. And out front of that building, what you would have, you would have these steep stairs going from the bottom all the way up to the top. And there were these ancient, incredible buildings. And the angels of God would ascend and descend on that structure. But what's so amazing for Jacob is he's out in the middle of nowhere. He was in a place that they wouldn't even have put a truck stop. It was an out of where, out of way, nowhere place. But Jacob takes this vision and he lets it recast his whole life. Listen to what this text said. When Jacob wakes up from the vision and the dream that he has of being connected to God, and without all of that architect even being present, he says, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. I did not know. And what does God do to Jacob's life? God took an ordinary, out-of-the-way place and turned it into a holy place. Several years ago, I participated in a citywide ministerial event in an auditorium at the Lebanon High School years ago. Everyone in that town from all faiths were invited to come together to pray for peace and for unity. I remember while attending that event, the first time that it occurred, sitting next to me was one of the black ministers of our local town. And I noticed near the end of that prayer breakfast, there were tears flowing down his cheeks. I wasn't surprised by those tears. But what amazed me even more was, was there were tears not flowing down a black minister's cheek, but tears flowing down the face of high school students. And I was intrigued by this. And so I asked them, why are you so moved? And this is what those high school students had to say. We gather in this auditorium all the time. We hear boring announcements and we hear some school programs that are not so good. And yet, all of a sudden, on this day, this auditorium has become a sanctuary, a holy place. Barring the words of Jacob, I think they might have said, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Let me ask you, if God can do that with a school auditorium, what will God can God do in your home? In your life? Right now. Will the Spirit of God give you a vision that your place at home where you are at now can become a holy place? If it does, then you may be like Jacob because after Jacob discovered that he was in the presence of God, he, he, he renamed that place Bethel. Long before there was a Bethlehem, a house of bread, long before there was a Bethesda, house of steadfast love, long before there was a Bethesda, a house for fishermen and hunter, there was a Bethel, a house for God. And if we're open to it and we will let, allow ourselves to see it, God can take an ordinary place in our life and turn it into a sacred place if we only have the vision to see it. 
Because even in our home, there can be this connection between heaven and earth. And the way you discover your true home is to cling to an old promise, to realize that there is a new perspective, and finally there is a renewed practice. If you'll know what's interesting in this text is, is the practice that Jacob engages in after his vision. It's one of the oldest ancient forms of marking territory and sacredness that we know. It was the stacking of stones. The stacking of stones was a practice that had been going on for a long time. Not only would it mark boundaries, it would, not only would it mark special places, it would also be the kind of thing that one would consecrate. According to our text, Jacob arises after stacking those stones and he pours oil over it. And he worships. And he turns those stones into an altar. And that is what God does when he calls us, us to realize that he is there. That every place can become a holy place and that all of our life is an act of worship. There's a true story of a young woman by the name of Immaculate. Immaculate was 22 years old when she was in college. And she goes home for Easter break. And when she's headed back home, it was right after the president of Rwanda had been killed, which sparked a genocide. Nearly a million people were killed, and all of a sudden, her family was killed and slaughtered. And she was a part of the Tutsit family, and the Hutu family were hunting them down. Immaculate with seven other women found shelter in the home of a pastor, hiding in a little tiny bathroom. She hid in that bathroom for 91 days. Scarcely any food, barely enough to drink, as she withered away. She could hear them searching for her outside the house many times, and miraculously, her and the seven other women were ne never found. She could hear them calling her name, looking for her. She says, I was haunted by their pursuit. Yet in spite of all of that, she wrote this. I found a place in that bathroom to call my own. A small corner in my heart. I retreated there as soon as I woke up and I stayed there until I slept. It was my sacred garden. I sat stone still on that dirt floor for hours upon hours, contemplating the purity of God's energy and the force of His love as it flowed through me like a sacred river cleansing my soul and easing my mind. You see, Immaculate's story is not just one of survival, but it's thriving in the midst of one of the most, one of the century's most devastating tragedies. And as hard as you and I sometimes find it to be at home, if God can do that for a matrily in a bathroom in the middle of a genocide, what kind of connection can God make with us through worship in our home? We hear. See, we often, so often associate worship with going to a place and to a building like the one I'm in. But wonder if in this moment, which you cannot, you can't come to this building, you can't come to this sanctuary to worship. But what if God brought that 
sanctuary to you, to your heart, to your home, to your life. What if one of the silver linings of this sheltering in place was it that you discover during this time that your true home, your true shelter is in God. And that you discover it by Jacob through an old promise, a new perspective, and a renewed practice in art that is worship. The antidote to loneliness is not just getting back together. The antidote to loneliness is worship. Because if you're like Jacob, when he laid down, fleeing for his life, Jacob discovers God, he worships God, and that he finds and discovers for his life for the first time. If you worship God, you are never, ever, ever really alone. And I don't know about you, but I firmly believe life's not a game. It's not like throwing a ball. I believe that life is much, much more than just being included or excluded from a particular activity. It's a tribute to Albert Einstein, but it has often been said that there are only two ways to live your life. One is though that nothing is a miracle, and the other is though everything is. And beloved, I believe that's the way God invites us to live our lives. That everything, every moment, every day, every part of your home, every part of your family, every part of your life is a miracle. But you will only know that through the promise and through the perspective and through the practice of worship. God makes a promise to you this day in the same way he made a promise to Jacob. And I just wonder, I wonder if you'd be willing to join Jacob in that ancient covenant, that vow, thy saying, so will I. Surely the presence of the Lord was in his place, and I did not know it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask for you to have the same presence of that same spirit that reached immaculately in that horrible situation. That that very same power, that that very same spirit reached into the homes in Bowling Green and around the world. That people will believe that old promise and know that it has not gone bad. But that promise is still true and relevant and personal for all of us. I pray, O oh God, for those who need to wake up to that reality that are in your midst this day. That help them discover, O oh God, that you're in the place that they are. And maybe they cannot see it. So if that's true, oh God, give them a vision. A vision of being connected to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I pray, oh God, for all those who are listening this day. May they right now be ushered into the everlasting presence of our Heavenly Father. 
And may we join you in heart falling before your throne of grace. For we pray these things in the matchless, wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to join with us in this morning in your home. I hope you have discovered what Jacob discovered that night when he had a dream. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place where we are today. But God is in your home. Seeking you, pursuing you to have a relationship with you. If you will just have the eyes of faith to see that God is present among you. And so if you've never surrendered your heart and life to Jesus Christ, stack those stones and anoint them with all. And make that place a place of worship this day in your home. Invite Jesus Christ into your life. Let him fulfill that promise that he made to Jacob so long ago. To you this very day. Will you join with me as we sing, Take My Life and Let It Be. Thank you. 